he said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love thee. Jesus said to him, Feed my lambs. A song which I learned in Sunday school goes like this. We are climbing Jacob's ladder. We are climbing Jacob's ladder. We are climbing Jacob's ladder, brother, sister, all. Every rung goes higher and higher. Every rung goes higher and higher. Every rung goes higher and higher. Brother, sister, all. I believe that that song teaches us a vital lesson for in our faith journey, we are expected to move to higher levels in our scriptural holiness. This, I believe, is reflected in today's gospel reading from John chapter 21, verses 1 to 19. Here is presented for us a wonderful resurrection encounter that Jesus had with seven of his disciples. In that encounter, a significant chunk of the story reflects the tasking of Simon Peter, in which Simon was moved from the familiar task of going out and casting a net and hauling in fish to the unfamiliar one of shepherding persons. In effect, Peter was moved from a task wherein he was apparently looking at his, after his own interests and well-being to instead undertaking a task where he was now driven by a Christ-centered pastoral emphasis. In the process, Jesus took Peter to a higher level of discipleship, not only anchoring what he had to tell him in his Peter love for Jesus, but giving him a task where he, Peter, had to depend completely on the Lord. In Luke chapter 5, verses 1 to 11, we have the story in which Jesus requested Simon Peter to launch out into the deep for a cash. Simon obeyed, and he caught so much fish that he was able to recognize his own sinfulness before Jesus. And Jesus told him then that the task was to catch people. Based on Peter's knowledge at that time, bringing people to Jesus would have sufficed. And as we ourselves think of evangelizing, our concepts can be similar. So we go out, we proclaim the word in whatever form, we invite persons to come and to accept the Lord Jesus Christ, and we bring them to him. And that is a basic understanding of evangelism. Conversely, John chapter 21 pointedly tell us that Jesus was now calling the same Simon Peter to a highly interpersonal task of feeding and tending. Certainly for you and for me, we are not at liberty to simply adopt the old task, to do things the old way, but we must ever be vigilant seeking to be in tune with Jesus so that the present-day needs are effectively addressed through us. 
We are reminded time and time again that Jesus is no longer in the world as he was during his earthly ministry. And if Jesus is to accomplish anything, if Jesus is to touch the lives and bring wholeness to humanity, if Jesus is to carry out his miraculous deeds, we are the only instruments that he has available. Today, May the 1st, 2022, is International Workers Day. And on this day, I believe that we ought to seriously carry out an introspection regarding our role in the current struggle of workers. Not necessarily for us to zero in on workers in far out distant lands as we used to do for missionary, but to recognize that right in our midst, right under our noses, there are some things that we ought to be doing. As such, our Christian relationship, motives, and mission are key starting points as we reflect on our role as a church. Permit me to guide you along those three. One, relationship with Jesus. A fundamental aspect of being a disciple and believer is our relationship with Jesus. So at the crucial juncture that occurred in Peter's life will occur in ours. In Peter's faith journey, he had to face up to the state of his relationship with Jesus. And Jesus brought it pointedly to the fore, questioning the extent of his love for him. Despite all that Jesus had taught and shown his disciples during his earthly ministry, it appeared that after Jesus' crucifixion, they seemed to have lost their way and they were unsure how to go forward, facing the uncertainties of life and the hostile future as history has shown us. So there's no wonder then that the gospel writer of John records for us that on the evening of the resurrection, they were behind locked doors for fear of the Jews. We can agree that it was a natural feeling, a natural reaction because of the uncertainty of what the future will hold for them. Consequently, Peter chose to return to the familiar realm where he fished in his old style of tossing the net and hauling in. In so doing, Peter turned away from his love for Jesus and forsook the commission as recorded in Matthew chapter 28, verse 19. Go and make disciples of all nations. And whenever we read that, whenever we read that over and over, it is not talking only about nations in terms of St. Vincent and the Grenadines or Barbados or Trinidad or India, but it's really talking about the people all around us. The people who we encounter in our homes, the people who we encounter in our villages, the people who we encounter in the marketplace, the people who we encounter in the workplace, or even our social and sports gathering. I love Jesus for lovingly Jesus later took the initiative to have a meal with Peter 
and in a socialized environment confront the relationship issue. One of the clear indications of a cordial relationship is the mutual partaking of a meal for doing dining Individuals would often reveal a lot about themselves that they would otherwise keep secretive. While the words of John chapter 21, verse 15, while they had finished breakfast, appeared to be cursory glance, the truth is that it was very significant. On deeper reflection, these words represent Jesus wishing out to invite Peter back where he belonged. The meal was in fact a symbol that Jesus had forgiven him and that Jesus sought reconciliation with him. For if Peter was going to undertake the Christ-centered task of bringing wholeness to the lives of people, he had to renew his relationship with Jesus. In effect, regardless of what Peter's action may have been and how we may label that action in terms of going back to fish, importantly, Jesus needed Peter then. At this juncture of our national history, I want to say to every Methodist man and woman and those under the influence of the Methodist Church within the hearing of my voice that we can be encouraged in this month of May even as we will reflect upon Methodism coming out of the artist's great experience of our founding fathers, John and Charles Wesley. We can be encouraged in this month of May by the absolute commitment to Jesus which our forefathers and mothers demonstrated over the years. The Methodist Church have always been a church that has stepped out where others refuse to go. And the history will show in these Caribbean islands that just as John Wesley, leaving the confines of the Anglican Church, went out and began to fought for the rights of the coal miners, the Methodist Church, through the persons who came to our shore, step out where these established churches didn't want to go, and they fought for the rights of the slaves, helping to break down the barriers. Many times it cost them their lives. They had to run away from those places. William Chosebury running away from Barbados with a pregnant um, wife and coming to St. Vincent is a case in point. But what for me is exciting is that Jesus always takes the initiative and he always moves us to a higher level in our faith journey. We must be willing always to submit ourselves to God's will. Always regardless of where that may lead us, regardless of what may happen to us as individuals. Two, motives for actions. Jesus said to Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? These words, I believe, represent a serious questioning of Peter's motive for taking the decision that he took. After the crucifixion of Jesus, Peter was regarded as the leader of the disciples. 
So it meant that he had influence over them and was able to lead them in any direction he chose. Numbered among the disciples whom Peter influenced to return to fish were Thomas, who we often refer to as the doubter because of him wanting proof about Jesus' resurrection. Nathaniel, who questioned if any good thing can come out of Nazareth, the place where Jesus grew up. James and John, who requested to obtain honored places in Christ's glory, and two others. As Jesus questioned Peter concerning Peter's love for Jesus, he was effectively challenging Peter to make the serious, difficult, and important choice between him, Jesus, and Peter's love for self and related things. Peter, with all honesty and sincerity, pledged his love for Christ and forsook the, the road that was easy for one that was difficult for this road led to Peter's own crucifixion upside down because he was loyal to Jesus. Peter forsook the way of doing things to gain personal pleasure and selected the way of doing things that glorified God. Over the years, the Methodist Church has been in the vanguard for social change wherever it has existed. I mention Britain. And the whole revival movement in Britain was much more than just John Wesley getting up and pushing sermons. It was a complete transformation of the landscape of his day. He took persons and he brought them not into the established church to cause them to be embarrassed with the way that the church would have treated them, but in small groupings called societies, a, a word that we adopted right away up to 1997, and he shaped them, having class leaders and other assistants assist him in working with people and shaping their lives. I mentioned in the Caribbean, and whether it has to do with education, that was the flagship of our mission, or whether it has to do with health care. And it's really interesting that during the course of the week, I was able to speak to one of our members here about what we are able to start looking at doing as far as healthcare is concerned, even with assistance from a reputable organization in the Caribbean. Or even if it was just situations where persons were just being model Christians, the Methodist Church has been in the vanguard for social change. History will show that Methodist people have not been afraid to get up wherever they were, even in the workplace, and stood up and speak out. And they were well respected because persons understood what they stood for. And so today, as we as a modern day community join with workers all across the world, particularly the workers here in the Caribbean, and many of us being numbered among those workers, we need to remember that the struggle still continues. We are now entering, or we have entered, in fact, the third year of the COVID-19 pandemic and its effect upon the Caribbean. 
Sometimes we get the impression that, yes, at last, things are abated, abating, and then it comes back up again. There's an upsurge as it's beginning to happen again in our midst. But it can be easy for workers having to struggle. I can tell you even wearing a mask during the day how difficult it is for me to think of persons who because of the allergies and because of asthmatic condition, it is really unbearable for them. And we have to do it because of the situation. It can be easy that where we were in an environment where our vacation time, we will deliberately take our vacation so that we can be with the children to know where the children are constantly being left on their own. And the truth is there are some children who are dropping through the cracks because they are not on the system remaining there and being taught. And even as they go to school, you and I know that it is not really as it used to be before. It is not easy raising our children and restricting them in their playtime and their interaction with others when you and I know as children that we were able to be healthy and to achieve so much because we interacted with others, climbing trees, doing all sorts of things as much as we were given the opportunity to do. So the mental health of our workers must be a concern for the Methodist Church. The mental health of our workers must mean that we want to get in there and see how we can help in any way possible. We have to look for ways and means of establishing, even in our spaces that we have, the kind of ministries that will help with counseling um, for families, mothers and fathers and children who are struggling at this time. We need to revisit to the condition of workers. And when I talk about the condition of workers, I would, I'm talking about the condition on which people live under, the terms and condition of their jobs, the salary levels that persons are working for in, in the midst of the high cost of living. We have to be, as a church, in the vanguard for talking and conversing on these matters and bringing them to the fore and making serious suggestions of how government can pass legislation of one kind or another to help. As Peter will examine his motives and thereby cast off the outer man of the flesh, he paved the way for his spirit, the inner man, to be inseparably joined to the spirit of God. We too can and must be propelled by motives that reflect God's love for all human beings, regardless of class, color, or creed. Thirdly and lastly, mission to undertake. One of our common complaints is that there's so much to do and sometimes very little time in which to do it. We can therefore easily be hustling from what we say to pull at the post and still leaving vital things undone. It therefore becomes very necessary that as we seek to reorder our lives, as we seek to reorder our mission as a church, that we do that which is essential, even being prepared to leave out that which isn't. With the renewed love for Christ, Simon, I'm sure, would have been willing to do a whole lot of things in order to please the Lord. And that can easily happen to us. In our zeal, in our excitement, we want to do so much to please the Lord. 
However, Jesus considered it absolutely important that Peter understood clearly what he was commissioned to do. He was commissioned to feed and tend. And this was completely contrary to his career of going out and fishing. When Peter went out to fish, he just had to use what he knew, what he learned. Tossing the net in a particular way and hauling it ashore. As one now called to feed and tend, he had to undergo a character change for he had to become a shepherd. A shepherd with a vital technique of caring, loving, and developing. Peter was previously regarded as being rough and hasty and loud mouth. And it meant now that he had to be faithful in the newly assigned task, learning how to fully depend on Christ and the enabling of the Holy Spirit. In John chapter 21, verse 15, he is exalted to feed Christ's lambs. In the book, God's Psychiatry, Charles L. Allen, while reviewing Psalm 23, describe a lamb as being timid, a poor swimmer, and having other limitations. In fact, I'm sure that, like me, you have described a lamb as a silly animal, because sometimes it's so bent on following the leader that it puts his life in danger, even crossing a busy highway. For when the first one steps out, all the others follow. Anyone with the mission of feeding them must be like a good shepherd, gentle, understanding the limitations, and acknowledging the weaknesses, taking them into safe places. But who are the lambs? Who are the lambs? We make a mistake if we simply say they're young. We make a mistake. The lambs here are represented of the young, yes, the immature, the weak, and the vulnerable in society. And there's so many persons in society who the system unfails. We have to tend them. We have to feed them. They need our guidance. They need our care. They need our training. They need our protection. You see then that if we really want to do what Christ wants us to do, we will be so much taken up in the task of tending and caring, going where others are, even dirtying our hands with the filth that they may live in in order to help them to come to a different level. It is serious business being a Methodist. It is serious business for the mission that we proclaim is never a mission that is worked out by us to suit our advantage, but it's a difficult mission of transforming the nation. In fact, it is said about the Methodist Church that the Methodist Church was raised up to spread scriptural holiness throughout the land and to transform the nation. And from my experience, transformation don't come at a distance. Transformation comes as we get down in the trenches with the people, do what is necessary, hear the concerns, and relate to them. 
I will always remember the lady who came to me desperate out of her mind in relation to how she should deal with her deviant son. And then as I took on the task of going and meeting with her, and when she was not at one location, even going and looking for her, and going to her home, and sitting down and wrestling with her and the other persons who live in the home. And in the end, what I had to do went beyond the talk because it meant that I had to recognize there was a basic problem that had to be addressed in that home. And that is what I then had to zero in on. When we come to worship on Sunday mornings, in this glorious atmosphere, it should be like us going to a gas station and fueling up for the week ahead is one of serious ministering to the lives of men and women. Whether we are called ministers or preachers or class leaders or Sunday school teachers or organization leaders, we have an essential role of shepherding to perform for our mission is to build up lives. Our mission is to bring wholeness to men and women. Our business is to fight for those who can't fight for themselves. Our mission is even to join the protest line and say enough is enough. That's how I see our role. Today, as we encounter the risen Christ, let us all seek to be renewed so that we may be so faithful to Christ who loves us and who died to reconcile us to God and who now lives within our hearts. May this risen Christ who we celebrate so gloriously live also within the hearts of all those who will come under our influence because we are committed to the Christ-centered task in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.